Are we good now? Awesome. So I want to thank uh, Doctors Data for helping put this whole thing together, and I'm super excited to be here talking with you guys. So I want to mention that GI health is the foundation for mental health. There's just no other way to think about it. And you cannot have a perfect, beautiful, functioning brain if your microbiome is a disaster. You just can't. And I would say it works the other way as well. If you're stressed out of your mind and you've got a lot of things going on in terms of your mental health, it's going to directly impact your gut. And most of us know this intuitively. We get stomach aches or know someone who gets a stomach ache when they're really stressed. And we know that when our stomach is in distress, we just don't feel that great. But where the ball gets dropped, I think, for most patients, to be honest, is in the chronic aspect of this problem. So chronic microbiome imbalances, chronic GI problems lead to low-grade mental health problems like anxiety, depression, fatigue, memory problems. I mean, I have a small practice, but I work with hundreds of doctors every year and they submit labs and cases to the Kalish Institute. Almost every single patient that we work with has either depression, fatigue, anxiety, insomnia. I mean, there's something going on brain-wise. And I think where this gets complex and where the ball gets dropped the most often is that doctors just don't check the gut. You know, every case that you have that has any brain-related symptom, you have to do the digestive tract testing because they may not have any other symptoms of their gut imbalance besides the anxiety, depression, insomnia, you know, memory problems, et cetera. And we see this all the time. Patients with absolutely perfect gut health, according to them, they don't have any symptoms, who have a horrible gut problem that's triggering brain symptoms almost exclusively. So really could not recommend anything more strongly than just to do a gut test on every patient. Then you don't have to worry about it. Don't try to figure that one out. Okay, and then we have, and this is like super exciting because I've been working with Doctors Data for years and now we've put together this class, this lab interpretation boot camp. It's just a dream of mine here. So we get a whole class where you guys can submit your own labs and we can talk about your cases. And I developed a whole curriculum just for this about how to get started interpreting the GI 360. And so it's the first time we've offered this. I'm super excited about it. And Doctors Data is partnering with us. We have a coupon code. You can get a discount if you're a doctor's data client and you're coming to this class. And it's really, the idea here is to just get you super familiar with how to interpret the test and design clinically effective protocols. And it's, we'll have the time in this boot camp that we don't have in these, you know, one hour webinars to get the whole message across. So check it out if you're interested and you can use that discount code too. Okay. So here it is, the, the Doctors Data GI 360, really the premier test of its kind in our industry. And there's a complexity to it, which when you listen to the PhDs who have degrees in microbiology talk about this test, you can really get into it and it's exciting and fun and I've done a lot of that. But then when we're in the treatment room Monday morning and you're looking at a patient and you're looking at your test result, like how are you really going to communicate that kind of boots on the ground patient interaction kind of thing. And that's really what today is about. There's a, a system for analyzing the test, which is clinically impactful, but allows you to analyze the test relatively quickly and, and communicate that relatively eloquently to your patient. So they understand what's happening. So they get enrolled and involved and want to do this. That's kind of the goal of this whole system that I've set up here. And then we're also going to talk about how this all pulls back to or ties back into the brain. So guiding principle of functional medicine, GI dysfunction occurs with or without GI symptoms. It's the hardest lesson for us all to learn. I still wonder sometimes, should I run a GI test on that patient or not? But 100% of the time, you need to do that. Just don't question it. Just do it. You'll see why. If you run a GI test on 20 people with no GI symptoms, you'll see why it's so important because you're going to find a lot of problems. You're going to fix them. So. And this is just me asking you questions to kind of prompt you to try to do this, basically. If we're really treating the underlying cause, then why are we all so symptomatically oriented? We all are. I am too. I'm not blaming you guys. You just, everyone, that's just sort of the way the human brain works. So 
at least run the test, the GI test on every brain patient. Let's say that. Okay, you can start with that. So, and then with treatment, on the treatment side, whenever I design a program, I mean, I look at all these labs, and I've been doing this for 30 years, and then I get completely confused, and I get overwhelmed, and then I sit down, and then I write it all out on a pen, with a pen and paper, on a pad of paper, and then I put it together in my head, and then I design a program. And then the programs always look the same. They're very, very similar. But the process by which you get there is so complex. So what I want to try to do today is just give you the end result. This is actually what ends up happening. How you get here varies dramatically from case to case, but this is where you're gonna end up with three general categories of treatments. Microbiome treatments, GI organ treatments, or anti-bug treatments, anti-pathogen, anti-bacteria, anti-parasite treatments, trying to kill something, right? So either you're gonna to try to boost up the microbiome, you're gonna to try to support an organ, or you're going to try to kill something. Those are the three major options that I think we end up having at the end of the day. And so for option number one, which I also call sometimes stage one, there's a problem with a microbiome. So you're going to use prebiotics, polyphenols, probiotics, and fiber. Those are the treatments to help support the microbiome. Prebiotics, polyphenols, probiotics, and fiber. And then for the, what I call stage two, there's a GI organ problem. There's not that many organs, so you're in good shape here. There's the pancreas, you might use enzymes. There's the gallbladder, you might use gallbladder support. And then there's the gut lining. It can be inflamed, it could be an immune problem. So you may need to do some leaky gut repair or some GI immune boosting. It's a finite number of organs, really, and it's a finite number of problems that can occur. Item number three, or stage three, means there's some kind of bug that you need to kill, a parasite, bacteria, a yeast, something like that, and you're going to want to eradicate it. And there's either antimicrobial herbal programs you can do, and then there's, of course, uh, medications. Uh, albendazole, midbendazole, if they have worms, you might use uh, something like a flagell or a tinidazole or eudoxin. If they have a parasite, you might use a prev pack if they have H. pylori. So a bunch of different options on the medical side if you're prescribing. And then all of these bugs also have a natural slash herbal antimicrobial treatment that you can do. So then the problem is, what order are you going to do this in and how are you going to analyze the test to kind of get to the end result, which is just a list of supplements and a couple of medications? That's the tricky part. So I want to show you here a super simple system. And I don't want to diminish the import and the uh, depth of this particular lab because you could, and people do, spend years studying it. And I would encourage you to do that. I've spent at least a decade of my life just really focused on under, trying to understand the microbiome itself, just that part of this. So I'm, I'm not discouraging that, but at the same time, I want you guys to have a tool that you can use right away to treat people that's gonna be super effective. So stage one, stage two, stage three. Stage one, the microbiome is disrupted. And that's where all these problems start. Stage two, the microbiome has been disrupted for a while. Now the GI organs are getting involved and there's some kind of organ dysfunction. And then stage three, there's GI pathogens. And each one of these stages is clearly laid out on the lab. You just need to look at the lab and figure out which stage is going on and how you want to treat it. And so number one, stress, poor diet, have a cumulative effect. So the microbiome just doesn't you know, give up on you, so to speak. It, you know, but most of the people that we're working with have some kind of level of problem with their microbiome because they're under stress and because their diet's not that great and because they don't sleep that well and they don't exercise enough and all the things that happen that'll mess up someone's microbiome. Then in a stage two, now things are progressing. It's a little worse. There's an organ problem. Maybe your stomach isn't making enough hydrochloric acid or your pancreas is like, oh, I'm not going to make all the enzymes that you need today. Or the gallbladder, the gallbladder gives up frequently. Gallbladder is just like, I've had enough, enough of these fries and milkshakes. I'm just like going to take a break and not really work for you for a little while. It's like a gallbladder going on strike or something, you know? And then you can also have a leaky gut problem. And I, I think there's two general categories in there that you want to explain to patients. One is that you can have an inflammatory problem with the gut. The gut lining can be leaky, et cetera. And then you can also have a problem with gut immunity. The, the secretory IgA can be off. Um, I kind of separate those in my mind, but they're both happening, obviously, in the in the intestinal tract. And then the lab will clearly show you if there's a pathogen, parasite, bacteria, yeast overgrowth, et cetera. So if you can look at this lab 
and in like five minutes or so, figure out if the person's a stage one, stage two, or stage three, then you can start to line up your treatment options and start to sequence them and figure out how you're actually going to want to treat all this, right? Okay. And so stage one on this lab, they have a graphic which shows the microbiome balance. That was, let me just cut back here for a second so you can see it. That was this first slide here. And so that's really clearly laid out uh, right here, here, okay? And it tells you right there, microbiome abundance and diversity summary. Boom, right there, you don't have to wonder about it. And you don't have to scan through pages of 50 plus commensal bacteria and try to do all the math and figure out what's going on. They just summarize it in a simple graphic for you there, okay? But I just wanna point out, there's one other very important microbiome marker on this test, or series of markers really, and that has to do with the reality that the good gut bacteria take fiber and break that fiber down into fat. They they take in the fiber as a as a food for them for them, and then these bacteria dump out, get rid of the waste product is fat from fiber to fat. And then when I first read that, I was like, how is that even possible? Anyway, the miracles of biology, right? And we call these short chain fatty acids, but they're fats. The fats that are made out of fiber from these bacteria, and they turn out to be very, very important for your body. And there's a bunch of them, acetate, propionate, butyrate is kind of the most famous. And so if you see low short chain fatty acids, it implies that the bacteria that make those fatty acids are not present. So that's another ding against the health of your microbiome. And it turns out, that butyrate in particular has this funny little job. When it gets into your bloodstream, in addition to providing the majority of energy supply for your gut and being this amazing anti-inflammatory and immune modulating product, in addition to all these other roles it has, which are pretty amazing, it gets into your bloodstream, goes to your brain. And what do you think it does? Good things to your brain or bad things? It does really good things. It stimulates BDNF. It stimulates brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Can you believe that? So butyrate, it comes from the gut bacteria when it gets to your brain, and hopefully it's in your brain right now because you ate a bunch of fiber for lunch like I did, then that butyrate stimulates the growth of brain cells. And that's one very direct gut-brain connection. If you don't have those bacteria that make butyrate, brain cells won't grow adequately. Pretty profound. So in order to determine this disturbed microbiome issue, We've got our graphic, right, that they just lay it out here for, super simple. And then you're also going to look at the short chain fatty acid markers. And then in terms of treatment, you're going to think about fiber, prebiotics, including polyphenols. I guess fiber is a prebiotic, so you could kind of lump those together. And then probiotics. And it's not that hard to treat a microbiome imbalance. You don't have to get you know, organism specific. This co question comes up in class every week now. Um, there's because there's a new product that came on the market that is just for boosting acromantia mucinophila. And it's like, should we take this? I don't know. It's pretty specific. You want to boost this entire system, maybe more so than you just want to boost one organism above all the others, even though acromantia is really important. So, fiber will stimulate the fiber consuming bacteria to consume the fiber so that they make these short chain fatty acids. It also sets in motion a whole series of events where other bacteria start to grow out because this first group is feeding on the fiber. Polyphenols are a food supply for some of these other organisms. And the polyphenols you're gonna find are obviously in things like cranberry and blueberry, et cetera, where you, pomegranate, where, um, those polyphenols are going to be absorbed uh, not across the intestinal tract lining, but they're going to be absorbed into the good bacteria. They pull them in as a food supply and live on them. A lot of these polyphenols are large molecular structures, and they don't absorb so well across the intestinal lining into our bloodstream. But the bacteria are like, woohoo, you ate blueberries today. That's great. I'm going to use that polyphenol that you just consumed in the blueberry as my fuel supply, and it gets them to grow out. And then, of course, you can use probiotics. That's sort of self-evident, I guess. Now, with stage two, how are you going to identify that? You're going to be looking for problems with digestion, malabsorption, et cetera. And here we go. 
So it's just laid out right in front of you on the lab. You couldn't miss this if you if you tried. So elastase, obviously a pancreatic enzyme marker. Uh, fat stain, obviously related to gallbladder. You can see there's a whole section here on inflammation. That would mean there's a problem with the intestinal tract. And then immunology, the secretory IgA, also means that there's a problem with the intestinal tract. So it's pretty straightforward to figure this out. And there are every company, every large supplement company that we work with will have an anti-inflammatory gut repair powder. And they all also have an immune enhancing gut repair powder. So depending on if the inflammatory markers are high, you can use the anti-inflammatory powder. If the, there's a problem with SIGA, you can use the products. And they also often have some kind of IgG thing in them, right? And sometimes that's even on the label. So there, but it'll be clearly indicated that that product is designed to help improve gut immunity. And then if the elastase marker is out of range. You use pancreatic enzymes. If there's a problem with a gallbladder marker, use some gallbladder support. So now stage two, we're focused on organ dysfunction. Stage one, we are focused on fiber and polyphenols for treating the microbiome itself. You can also get butyrate in a supplement form too. And again, here we go. Does the patient need digestive enzymes or gallbladder support? It's all laid out right in front of you on the lab, so you don't have to guess about that. It's the beauty of these tests. And then again, if there's a problem with any of these markers, lactoferrin, lysozyme, or calprotectin, you know there's some inflammatory reactions going on in the gut, and you want to use a leaky gut repair slash anti-inflammatory powder. And they all have you know, um, glutamine as one of the main ingredients. It's easy to spot those powders. You can also use gallbladder support, and it's a, uh, most of the gallbladder product, products are not uh, vegetarian friendly because they're made with an animal product, but they work really, really well. So if the person's a vegan, you maybe have to look elsewhere and find something a little more unique for gallbladder support. But for most people, you can use um, these products, and they'll have usually a combination of things like silymarin and artichoke and dandelion and maybe some vitamins or minerals and then some... Um, animal-based, you know, ox bile type product to help with your gallbladder. Pancreatic enzymes are easy to get, okay? And these treatments are not too, too complicated. Really, where most of the complication comes for most people is trying to sequence things and get the order right. So we can talk about that when we look at some labs here. So we'll look at labs in a minute once we get through the slides, okay? Uh, then how do you find a stage three? That's the easiest because it'll just tell you there's a pathogen. It's like a yes or no question. There's no ambiguity about that. You just have to read the lab. And believe it or not, every year I get at least one patient who comes in with a GI stool test that clearly shows they have an infection from another doctor, you know, another doctor. And I'll look at the test and say, oh, you have Giardia. And they'll be like, oh, my other doctor didn't tell me that. I don't know. People just need to wear glasses more often or whatever. Or the doctors are missing this or they don't think that you should treat Giardia or whatever. But super easy to identify a pathogen. All you have to do is um, look at the test. And if it's there, you're gonna to wanna to treat it. I would strongly advise the treatment of pathogens whenever you find them. I mean, don't treat them if they're not there, but uh, don't ignore them if they are, you know? And here we go. Again, it's like, they couldn't make this easier. If it's green, you're okay. If it's red, it's a big problem. And there's no ambiguity, either it's there or it's not, okay? So again, diantamoeba fragilis, Blastocystis hominis, Entamoeba histolytica, Giardia. It's all our favorite bugs there, you know, that need to be treated. And I don't know, there's nothing as fun in practice as finding a patient that's had a parasite for a long time and then getting rid of it. In fact, you know, in the current mentorship class right now, and I won't mention any names, but it's the Wednesday, no, it's Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. group. There are two doctors in that class that just did their stool tests, and they both have e-histo. What are the odds on that? <laughs> it's so cool. It's so amazing, right? And so, we're, we're because we talk for an hour every week with this group, and we're not even talking about patients now. The doctors are talking about themselves in the class. And I can tell you, if you have a patient with a parasite, whether you, it's you, and, and this is maybe my call out for all of us practitioners, test yourself. One of these women has obvious GI symptoms, the other one doesn't, okay? So even if you don't have any GI symptoms, if you have not done a GI 360 in the last five years on yourself, just, just go do one right now, okay? And in fact, just 
don't even not right now finish this lecture and then go do it okay order yourself a kit because doctors trust me are riddled with these infections and as much as my regular patients are in practice so test yourself we have high stress jobs you know it's not an easy life and we're exposed to a lot of stresses and we get these bugs okay so then this is a little confusing, but there are bacteria in the gut that are good, that we call commensals. And then there's some of these bacteria that eh, we're not so happy about. And if they overgrow, those bacteria, if they overgrow, then we call it dysbiosis. So this is confusing to patients because not all the bacteria in the gut are good. Some of them are commensals and good. Some of them potentially can be uh, triggering something called dysbiosis. So again, you don't have to memorize the names of all these different organisms. You just have to look on the lab and they'll have a dysbiosis index. Okay, and it's not even a number that you have to worry about. You can, you, they give you a score, they give you a number, but just look at the graphic. Green is good, yellow not so good, red really bad. Okay, so immediately just looking at the graphic, you can tell right away if a patient is in great shape or not, okay? And this particular case is quite good. So then the different kinds of pathogen treatments are as wildly different as one could get. And one doesn't necessarily help with the other. So parasites, antimicrobial, herbal programs, and in some cases, medications. And again, you guys are probably you know, familiar with the medications, but there's flagyl, there's yodoxin, there's tinidazole, and then there's the, the whoop-de-doo one, um, the kind of heavy hitter one called Alinea that's used frequently for parasitic infections in the integrated medicine world. And then for bacteria with C. diff, um, there's medical treatments, and then there's also non-medical treatments. You can go either way. H. pylori, you can do a Prev pack. You can also get it with Mastica. Um, you have a whole bunch of options, really. Almost all of these bugs have a natural medicine option and then a prescription option. And then you just have to determine on a per-patient basis what makes the most sense. Yeast overgrowth, exactly the same thing. Anti-yeast herbal programs, or you can use medications. So just a quick summary, stage one, we're going to look at labs in a few minutes, I promise you. So stage one, problem with the normal bacteria. Stage two, a problem with the organs. Stage three, there's an issue going on with uh, a bug, some kind of a pathogen, okay? So when we look at the labs, that's all we're looking for. Is there a stage one, two, or three present? And then what are we going to treat? I already went over this a bunch of times, but just a little refresher there, what the treatments are. There's only like, I don't know, maybe three or four choices for each category. So it's a, it's a finite number of things that you have to learn, very finite. And then a large part of functional medicine, I guess the largest part, my teacher, Dr. Timmons, always used to say 80% of the job um, is lifestyle. So if they have a stage one problem, you want to coach them on a fiber-rich and polyphenol-rich diet. Beans and berries. Beans are the best source of fiber for the human body, and berries are the best source of polyphenols. Of course, there, you know, apples have fiber too. There's many other options, but people should be eating, you know, beans, maybe not every day, but almost every day, and for sure should be eating berries pretty much every day, um, to make sure you're getting the fiber and polyphenols that you need. And then for stage two, if they have a problem with their pancreas, gallbladder, all these kinds of things, you want to coach them about chewing their food well about taking a minute to relax before they eat, about taking two or three minutes after every meal to just relax before they jump up and start to do something else, you know? And then when stage threes are present, they have a yeast problem or crypto or something like that, you have to get into these more complex diets usually to really get the bugs calmed down. Um, that's a whole other kind of kettle of worms or whatever the expression is. So, and then which, which stage are you going to treat first? And I think this is the, the confusing part, because how do you know where to start? I think part of it revolves around your confidence and skill level and how much you know, experience you have. Part of it revolves around how sick the patient is, how sensitive the patient is. And some of it actually just revolves around time and money issues. So like the, you know, the herbal programs are kind of expensive. You may want to be super efficient if somebody has time and money issues. And super efficient to me means immediately killing the pathogens. But if the patient's super sick though, and they're like reactive to every supplement they ever took, and they have like five autoimmune illnesses, and 
that now they're starting to get Parkinson's or something like complicated case, then you probably don't want to just go in and start killing pathogens aggressively in the very beginning. You probably want to start with something simple like a microbiome support program and just get them the polyphenols and the fiber and the probiotics and see how they start to respond. Or maybe just give them pancreatic enzymes and gallbladder support and see how they respond to that. Or just do a leaky gut program and leave that alone for three or four months and see how the person kind of progresses. The more advanced treatments, like the stage three stuff, is more likely to cause side effects and problems. A stage one treatment, very likely to help people dramatically, but not likely to cause a lot of side effects. And some people do all three stages all at the same time. You know, it's a lot of products for people to take, but you can do that. Or sometimes people will start by supporting the microbiome for a few months and then go for killing. Some people do it the opposite way. So there's almost infinite variations. If you ask me what I usually do, I always try to treat the pathogens first if I can. If that's not going to work, then I flip the order and I start with the microbiome support and kind of work my way up to the point where the person's healthy enough and strong enough that we can treat the pathogens. Now, if there's no pathogens present, then you don't have to worry about that. And you could start with either the microbiome treatments or the organ treatments. And it's very common for people to do the microbiome treatments and the organ support together at the same time. In fact, there's been a lot of doctors I've worked with in the past that are quite uh, you know, kind of exceptional practitioners that'll do like a two-month anti-inflammatory gut repair program and for, on, on every new patient, basically, you know, and just let things settle down before they get into doing the more uh, aggressive treatments that might cause side effects. Okay, so now we're going to segue over to the brain part of this. And I think you'll find, as I have, that the combination of a gut problem and a brain problem is going to be present. I mean, you're going to just say it this way. You're going to see it every day of the week. It's not going to be something that's like a once a month kind of thing. Okay, maybe it's not every single patient that walks in the door, but every day you're definitely going to have a couple of people that have a gut problem and a neurotransmitter problem. They may not have developed at the same moment in the same time or for the same reasons, but they're going to be paired together really frequently. And so we want to be able to test the brain and correct the neurotransmitter related issues as we're correcting the gut. And there are a lot of programs that you want to wait until the gut is better before you treat X, Y, and Z, you know, but with the neurotransmitter support, you can absolutely jump in and treat the brain with amino acids in the very beginning, even before the gut is better. People just simply do not have trouble absorbing the amino acids that support the brain, even when their gut is messed up. Okay, And there, again, are some programs that you want to defer or you want to wait until the gut treatment has been completed before you start. But the brain you can jump in with right away and um, you'll have really great results. Okay, so here are the basic pathways. I don't know, that looks a little daunting, doesn't it? But let me try to point around here and show you the things that you really need to know. So you definitely need to know that tyrosine is how you make L-DOPA, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. That's pretty important. And then to re reverse it a bit, you should know that phenylalanine converts into tyrosine. I think it's kind of incredible. I mean, it's basic biochemistry that your body can take one amino acid and make another one, but it's kind of cool. So your body makes tyrosine from phenylalanine. So sometimes you'll see these two paired together in terms of having a problem. On the other side here with serotonin, your body takes tryptophan, it converts it into something called 5-hydroxytryptophan, and then that converts into serotonin. So in both of these pathways, but especially in the serotonin pathway, the real rate limiting step in the production of serotonin is going to be vitamin B6. And it's represented here as P5P, peroxyl 5 phosphate. That's a pretty important fact. So, in other words, if you give the person just the perfect amount of 5 HTP to fix their serotonin problem, it won't work if they don't have enough B6 in their system. Not even a little bit, it just won't convert. I mean, it'll do other things. I don't know what your body does with it. It'll probably just metabolize it and break it down and do something else with it. But it won't convert into serotonin unless B6 is present. So just make sure 
that you cover your bases and you always give people B complex with an extra, you know, maybe even a little bit of extra B6 in it to make sure that you're able to make serotonin. Uh, tyrosine converting to L-dopa has uh, a similar issue here. Uh, from I'm sorry, from uh, from L-dopa to dopamine, you also need uh, B6. Okay, so it's, it's true on both sides, but it seems to be more of a problem with serotonin for some people. So as part of the brain correction of this gut brain scenario, we want to learn how to use tyrosine and L-dopa. L-dopa is sold in a supplement form as something called macuna or macuna purines. Okay, so we want to learn how to use tyrosine and macuna or L-dopa. And then on this side, you want to learn how to use tryptophan and 5-HTP. And then you need to be able to coordinate them together. I don't know if you ever learned how to juggle, but I was like 15 years old, I learned how to juggle. And first you learn juggling two balls and then you have to get three balls in the air and that's a lot harder. So we're talking about like four balls in the air here at the same time, because you got tyrosine and macuna on one side, tryptophan and 5-HTP on the other side, and then they're interactive. So you have to get the balance between them right, which sounds hard, it, 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 but there's some starting points that you can do that are pretty straightforward, okay? And then here are some of the other amino acids as well that are responsible for neurotransmitter production. And then we're thinking about it from like a why does this happen standpoint. I think it's easy, again, as a patient communication tool to just let people know, hey, there's a couple of different reasons why your brain could be imbalanced. It could just be a deficiency state that could be damage to the neurons, or there could be some genetic issue going on. So. Deficiency states would mean you have a bad diet or you have a bad gut. Maybe you have a great diet, but your absorption is not so good. That's going to cause a neurotransmitter deficiency. Definitely. Could also have drug depletion. Long-term use of SSRIs can deplete neurotransmitters, ironically. You could also have what I call a type 2. That would be a damaged neuron. Or it's not one neuron, right? Damaged neurons. Toxins, environmental toxins, kind of notorious, things like lead, mercury, cadmium, for getting into the brain and causing you know, destruction of the neurons themselves. If you want to see that graphically, I watch a lot of action movies, which I'm not proud of, but I really enjoy action movies. This is like an action movie for neurons. If you Google University of Calgary Mercury video, it's really old. It's like 40, I don't know how old it is, but it... It sound, the, the voice narration sounds like your sixth grade science teacher, but it's pretty cool video. So what you see is a neuron, or they call it neurofibril, and then the, the voice is like, and now you will see the mercury molecule introduced. And they actually film a, a neuron having a fight with a mercury molecule, and it's not pretty. You just see the neuron itself just go, <laughs> it just gets like roasted up, it's just like a plane blowing up in an action movie or something. It's horrible. When I first saw that, I was like, it just made it so graphic. It's like, wow, it's not like a theoretical thing. Like mercury like chews up and destroys your neurons. It's just like shreds them. Horrible, horrible. So anyways, you can have damage. And a lot of people have environmental toxin exposure. You can also have damaged neurons from a head trauma. You hit your head in a car accident against a windshield, some kind of concussion in sports, things like that. Doesn't really matter what damages the neuron, if it's an environmental toxin or if it's a blow to the head, you're still going to have damaged neurons either way. And then as you well know, there's all kinds of genetic factors that come into play. There's methylation defects and the, the MTHFR gene is kind of famous. There's COMPT defects, COMT, the enzyme that helps uh, metabolize uh, the catecholamines. So there's a lot of genetic factors that are at play with the brain as well. And for a lot of patients, there's varieties of all three of these things going on. If they have a GI issue that's related to their brain, if you fix the gut and put them on neurotransmitter support for six months or a year, they'll be 100% better. If they have a toxin-induced problem with their brain, if you fix their gut and put them on neurotransmitters, they'll get better. But when you stop the neurotransmitter support, you know, the problem's not going to be solved. So you have to, you know, do detoxification tests and get the detox pathways working properly. If they have genetic factors involved, you fix the gut, you put them on the neurotransmitter support, they feel great. You, you know, it's a year into the program, you stop the neurotransmitter support, all their problems come back. Put them back on, all the problems go away. Take them off, all the problems come back. So you, you, you figure out usually within the first six months or a year or two, if you are actually going to fix this problem, you know, or if there's going to be such a preponderance of 
impact, there's so much impact from the genetics that you're going to need to keep the person on the program more long term. But ideally, if it's GI driven or neurotoxin driven, we can correct the gut, correct the brain, and then withdraw all the supplements and have the patient maintain the benefit. And Dr. Budding is an old guy that I worked with 30 years ago. I can just remember him saying this so clearly. It still sticks with me. He said, the better you do at this job, the better you do, the better you are at this job, the fewer things you do for the shorter period of time, shorter period of time. So in other words, the goal is to get people off the supplements, but sometimes you can't if there's a genetic problem. Okay, then in terms of patient experience, weight gain, fatigue, depression, alcohol cravings, food cravings, anxiety, panic attacks. It's just the common stuff that we see in practice all the time, body pain, inflammatory disorders. And this, this is a tricky slide, right? Because this is a brain slide. In other words, brain problems can cause all this, but really it's a gut slide. The gut problems cause the exact same symptoms. There's no difference, as I was saying in the very beginning. If you study this, and you're really just curious about it, there's a lot of information about inflammation in the brain and how all this ties back. So there's just a couple of studies for you to peek at. You take a picture of that with your phone if you want and look at it later. And there's also this pathway, Kynurenin pathway. And uh, this seems like a pretty, you know, respected journal. It's not like the Whole Foods Weekly publication or something, the British Journal of Pharmacology, and they're into this stuff. The Kynurenin pathway as a therapeutic target in cognitive and neurodegenerative disorders. So this stuff is real. It's not just integrative medicine that's doing this, that's looking at this. So if your body is inflamed, let's say your gut is inflamed because you have an infection, that's going to drive this Kynurenin pathway. And you're going to take tryptophan, and convert it into the cytokines, it's going to end up with kynurinate going high, quinolinic acid or quinolinate going high. And the net result of that is that the inflammation and the cytokine production that's a result of that depletes your tryptophan. That means you don't have a lot of tryptophan available to make things like serotonin. So you can have a inflammatory slash gut generated cytokine burst that depletes your tryptophan and lowers your serotonin. So that's another pretty direct gut-brain connection. So again, gut inflammation leading to neuroinflammation, leading to depletion of tryptophan, leading to a problem with serotonin production. Obviously, the solution there is to get rid of the inflammation and then replace the tryptophan. I think this is funny. I don't know if this comes across as a joke to you guys, but there's a journal. Did you know this? An International Journal of Tryptophan Research. When I found this, I was just like, I can't believe this group of people have devoted their lives towards tryptophan, but they take tryptophan very seriously. I was excited because I'm like, I'm really into tryptophan too. But we just said that if your gut's inflamed, cytokines go up, tryptophan gets depleted. Just keep that in the back of your mind. So according to the International Journal of Tryptophan Research, I don't really know who these people are, but the principal role of tryptophan in the human body is as a constituent of protein synthesis. So they're saying the main, and all, all the scientists agree on this. This is not this one group. Protein synthesis is the main role of tryptophan. That's all proteins throughout the human body, okay? So if your tryptophan drops because you have a gut infection and you're inflamed and you're making all these cytokines, it not only affects serotonin, it also affects protein synthesis. So this can have a body-wide effect, okay? And then, in fact, you know, it's not until you get to the third item that they start to talk about how important serotonin is in terms of tryptophan production. And again, here we have tryptophan going to 5-HTP, going to serotonin. And that's what we're really interested in doing, looking at and treating. And so not too hard. The lab will show you. They have a pretty clear triangle to just point out that something is low. So serotonin is low. And then here's the metabolite of serotonin, 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid, which everyone usually calls 5-HIAA. I like saying the whole thing though, 5 hydroxyindolacetic acid. I don't know, I think it sounds kind of cool. But 5 HIAA, uh, let's go back. Sorry, I have to go back a few slides. 
but just so you can see that, because you got to kind of memorize this. This is pretty important. Okay, remember, so let's go back to the slide. Here's our tryptophan. Here's our 5-HTP. See the serotonin right there? Okay, here's our 5-HIAA. So when the serotonin gets broken down and your body wants to get rid of it, that's the metabolite that gets dumped out in the urine. That's really important. It's a very, what would you say, great, a good representation of what's happening with serotonin, if it's being metabolized or not. And that marker goes up if someone's on an SSRI. So if you see high levels of 5-HIAA and the person's on an SSRI medication, that would be normal. And otherwise, if they're not on the drug, then it shows a high stress response and they're burning through their serotonin. Dopamine, similarly measured, pretty straightforward to see the markers here, if there's a problem or not. Catecholamines, also norepinephrine, epinephrine, similarly easy, easily measured. You can see if there's a problem or not. And oh, we're already at the point where we're going to talk about labs. Okay, so if you joined us late, just to mention that the Kalish Institute and Doctors Data partner together, and they are supporting us in doing a boot camp on the Doctors Data GI360. So this is an in-depth class. We're just going to talk about GI360s. You're going to be able to submit your own labs to the class with your own cases, and then we're going to. There's a curriculum I built, of course, that describes the different processes by which you can use to analyze the test. So you go through that curriculum each week, and then we'll have a series of live calls where you can submit labs and we can review them. And it's really like a lab interpretation program design class. So we just design program after program after program. Um, and the lectures are all pre-recorded. So the idea is that in the live time, the live Q&A time that we have for this boot camp, we're either looking at one of your labs from the you people who submitted them and the students, or we're designing a program and just boom, 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 boom. And I, I believe in repetition. If you just if you see five programs designed based on these labs, you get okay, good. But if you see 25 programs designed, you get pretty good. Once you've seen 100 of these, I find in general with our mentorship students, once they've seen 400 programs designed, they got it. You know, they've seen most of the common things you're going to see in practice and they're just, they just have that confidence, you know, they just walk into the room and they just know that I'm going to be able to figure this out because this is like the 435th time I've done this. But those first five, 10, 20 tests, I mean, if you're not sweating and worried and nervous, then you have a problem. You should be because, you know, you want to get your skill set up so that you can be super good at doing this, right? So let's take a look at some labs, and then we'll have time for questions too. Uh, let's see here. All right, so we're going to look at the combination here and then think about program design. So remember, we're scanning this GI360. We're looking for three things. Is there a microbiome problem? How are the organs? And is there a pathogen? So let's start with the microbiome, stage one. So you look here at the microbiome abundance and diversity summary, and you can see they balance this out pretty nicely and have a nice little description here to guide you on that. So that would be step one, determining if the microbiome is balanced or not. And by the way, yeah, well, I won't mention that. That's too complicated. All right, let's see. And then you go down to the portion that has the uh, short chain fatty acids. They're not right next to each other, so you have to kind of scoot around a little bit. Here we go. And you see if there's a problem with the short chain fatty acids. And if there is, then you know there's a microbiome issue. If there's a problem with that microbiome indicator, you know that there's a problem with the uh, microbiome. And then we're going to look for the second stage. That would be organ involvement. Elastase, fat stain, the inflammatory markers, and SIG-A, okay? That'll tell you about the organs. And remember, the inflammatory markers and immune markers would show that you need either an anti-inflammatory GI powder or an immune-boosting GI powder. And then elastase means pancreatic enzyme. Fat stain means that you need uh, some gallbladder support. And then the pathogens, I'll just show you where they all appear just so you're familiar with it. And then I'll show you another example where we can pick on. That, first of all, they'll show on the summary page here if there's a pathogen present, they'll let you know. And they're also showing you here under key findings that some of these commensal bacteria are low. So there's a lot of clues in this portion of the test too, okay? But just you should be able to scan through it. And then this, these next pages here, these are the commensal bacteria that we're kind of ignoring because they're summarized for us already. 
So you can kind of scroll through this and you can learn about each one of these bacteria if you if you have the time and you're interested. But now we're into the pathogen section and it's pretty clearly indicated, GI pathogens multiplex PCR. So you're just looking for any pathogens that show up here. And then again, another page of pathogens here. So you got to look at all this. And then more pathogens here. These are the roundworm things of the world. And then we're into pathogenic bacteria. So there's quite a few potential pathogen bugs that you need to screen for. All right, so let's look at one more of these here. And again, microbiome, organs, pathogens. Now, you'll also see here on this, under key findings, it's a little bit like a cheat sheet, is right away you can see, oh, they found yeast, so there's your bug. Uh, lactoferrin is high, so now you know there's inflammation in the intestinal tract. Propionate is low, now you know they need... Uh, you know, the microbiome screwed up because that's one of the uh, short chain fatty acids. So they'll also, and, and then they'll detect here, detect it. So they're going to show you under, under the key findings, the major things, and that's sort of a cheat sheet. But I think you should know and be comfortable with the different pages of the lab. So you can find it either here on the summary page or just poke around in the lab itself and find it. And then they're going to report on the flora here as a summary, as well as showing you the graphic. And here they say bacteroid, detes. Bacteroides, that's Bacteroides. I always get those two confused. Bacteroidetes versus Bacteroides. Bacteroides is low. So they're going to also give you clues under this expected flora summary part, as well as showing you the graphic. Okay. And uh, again, on the summary page, they have the dysbiosis index on this patient is being high. So right away, right away, you know, there's something you're going to have to kill. But then as you're scanning through, again, the first few pages are commensal bacteria. So we kind of go through them because that was summarized for us in those notes and in the graphic. Then you get to pathogenic bacteria, parasites here, okay? More parasites. And again, they're going to flag this in red if you have a problem. And then here we go. So there's some yeast overgrowth. You can see that was flagged in red. So you know there's something that you want to kill. And then into pathogenic bacteria, okay? So that's a quick look at a couple of these tests. Now let's take a quick look at some neurotransmitter tests, and then we'll have some time for questions. And again, I don't think it could get simpler than this. It just says what it is. And if it's low, it's a problem. If it's high, it's a problem. So you've got serotonin and dopamine, norepinephrine and epinephrine. You've got, I'm not talking about all the neurotransmitters today, um, but there's others you could obviously treat here, like uh, glycine and GABA and whatnot. Okay. So if these are low, you want to want to bring them up. And the ones that I'm focusing on today, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Serotonin is treated with 5-HTP or tryptophan. And then dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine treated with tyrosine. And in cases where there's a dramatic problem, you can add in macuna, which is the herbal form of L-DOPA. Okay, so those are very straightforward. And here's our nice pathway chart to just kind of remind you how all this stuff works. And uh, let's look at one more. And then you can combine and can and should combine these treatments, you know, so you should be jumping into like your stage one and two gut treatment along with your tyrosine for the brain. So in this case, if you see dopamine, epinephrine or norepinephrine low, you can use tyrosine. I usually start patients at a thousand milligrams of tyrosine three times a day. I don't know if people think that's kind of aggressive, but it's a good it's a good starting point. You can go higher if you need to. It's enough to let you know if, how much of the problem is going to go away or, or not. Um, and then if there's a serotonin imbalance, usually you want to start with somewhere between 100 and 300 of the 5-HTP. Typically, that's given at night uh, because it can make people drowsy. And then remember that that's not going to work unless there's enough B6 in their system. So you're always going to want to add some additional B6 as well. Right? Okay, so let's take a pause for a moment here and see if you guys have questions.